Is this banana for me? <laughs> so good morning. For those that, of you that are um, visiting us today, my name is Jane Campbell. And for those of you that are regulars, I'm still Jane Campbell. And I am um, asking that I would love to have some um, people come forward and speak to me this morning regarding doing greeting on Sundays. Um, this will be my last month as the greeter coordinator, so I would really like it if you could help me go out with a big bang, you know. This is my opus. and. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, if you would please, it, this is such an opportunity for everybody to, for me, it's been wonderful because I've, I've gotten to really know people and people's names. And so the past three years have been like the best for me. And I would really appreciate it if people would come forth this morning and, and support um, the greeters. So, thank you so much. <laughs> so, look around. Look around at other folks who have, like you, decided that being part of the body of Christ here and on our live streaming is very important. You could have been outside in the sunshine. You could have been in your gardens. You could have been at the beach. You could have been anywhere, but you chose to be here. And for that, I give thanks to God. I also want to alert you to something that you may have already discovered, but perhaps not yet. And that is that our hymn that is listed in the bulletin as hymn three, uh, 435 is just a trick. It really is just to try to see if you're awake, because the real hymn number is 436. Now, those of you who are astute have already caught that. Those of you who um, might have caught it, um, that's good. But for those of you for whom it would have just slid right by, and you'd be singing the whole wrong hymn, and wondering why everybody else was singing a different hymn, that's why. It's actually 436 when we get there. All right? Oh, welcome, welcome, welcome. Please do sign the guest book. Please do let us know of your attendance here that we might uh, celebrate that. And now, here's the first work of the day. With your immediate neighbor, might you be so willing as to pass the peace of Christ, greeting one another not in the way that you would greet each other at Hannaford's, but rather in a way that recognizes you are cellular bodies of Christ, right here, one with another. Pass the peace of the Christ. Uh, see, I love this part because now all of you have passed the peace of Christ with your immediate neighbor and you've all seated down back again. And now I say, please, if you're able, please stand up. And I invite us to share the call to worship, which is an adaptation of Psalm 145. I will extol you, my God, and bless your name forever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, and shall declare your mighty acts. We shall celebrate your abundant goodness, and shall sing aloud of your righteousness.
chair. In the unison prayer of invocation, let us say together, Living God, come, be known among us. Help us to perceive your presence as near as breath yet hidden. Help us to seek you as you are seeking us. Speak your word of power to our hearts and to our living in these days. Amen. My friends, please be seated. front here. All right. Excellent. Glad you're here. Aha. A color-coordinated cast as well. Lovely. Well, as some of you perhaps heard when Jane was up here doing the announcement, I have a banana. And no, it's not James, but it is actually for our time together here. And want to use it to show you something that I think is really important. So, how many of you have ever heard the phrase, ever heard someone say, sticks and stones may break my bones, but names can never harm me? Have you heard that? Or something like that? Okay. Okay, so this side has heard that, right. Now, it's a nice phrase, but you know what? It's not correct, because words can hurt. 
There are many words that are hurtful, and sometimes people mean to be mean, and sometimes they do not mean to be mean, but they still say things that are hurtful. So I've got my friend here, and I'm wondering if, if you were really angry or really upset with my friend Banana, what, what might you say to my friend that was mean? What would you, what, what mean word or words might you say to my friend here? Yeah, Miles. If you, 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 would, you would say something mean to him, and what would that mean thing be? Yeah, if you, if you really didn't like him, what would you say? His mom just said, pretend it's your sister. <laughs> okay, so here, 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 here is a banana, and, and you really don't like the banana, and you're going to say something, what would you say? You're bananas. You're just bananas. What would you say? You are too fat. What would you say if you were really angry or wanted to be mean to this banana? Crybaby. <laughs> You're curved. You're, a slip You're so yellow. You have no appeal. <laughs> okay, so so you would think you would think that that is just words, right? It's just <laughs> words. But there is something to be said for the power of words. There is something to be said that, in point of fact, words can cut. Yeah, words that you spoke can slice. Words that you said that you may not have even meant but was very hurtful could, in fact, cut somebody to the quick. As, you hate bananas? Oh, no, all right. The words that you say are very important. And so hurtful words can cut people up. Don't say them. Speak words of care. Speak words of love. Speak words of friendship. And that's part of what church school is about, is to learn the language of all of that. So I invite you to take this. To take your pieces and to head on down to your classes at this time. Good morning, everyone. Our uh, reading this morning is going to take place in Genesis 32, verses 22 through 31, on page 28 in your Bible, if you care to read along with me. Um, these verses are all about Jacob wrestling with God and prevailing. The story of Jacob comforts and confounds us. Why would God favor a man such a man. But you know, there's the a reassurance that God who extended grace to Jacob also extends us to us. Jacob wrestled with a powerful stranger who, God th who Jacob thinks is God. In any event, the nation Israel receives its name from Jacob, whom God renamed Israel, which means he wrestled with God. His wrestling match left Jacob with a powerful limp, but with a much better understanding of God. 
The same night, he got up and took his two wives, his two maids, and his 11 children and crossed the fort of Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream and likewise everything that he had. Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he struck him on the hip socket and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, let me go for the day is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then the man said, I sh you shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with humans and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he said, why is that you ask my name? And then he blessed him. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, For I have seen God face to face, and yet my life is preserved. Um, the sun rose upon him as he passed Peniel, limping because of his hip. Therefore, to this day, the Israelites do not eat the thigh muscle that is on the hip socket, because he struck Jacob on the hip socket of the thigh muscle. May God bless this reading. Thank you.
that I am always comforted or just plain old feel better when Karen is present. You know, I just, I'm just not myself without her. So I know she was here singing with the choir, and then I sat down, and then Faith was reading, and I'm scanning, looking for her, thinking maybe she's with our friends from Munson, Massachusetts, or maybe she's up with Mom, or maybe, you know, and I'm scanning. She's gone. She's gone. I'm thinking, that's really curious. And I look over, and Peter's at the piano, and gone. And then we start the hymn, and I hear the tambourine. <laughs> oh, okay, there she is, hiding behind Peter. All right. Okay, that's just an aside, a little backstory into how we are, or I am anyway, into worship. I'm particularly pleased to see um, Paul Zaraka here, because he's one of the people who will be able to appreciate something of extraordinary nature that has happened fairly recently, and that is the completion of contract talks with the NFL. There actually is going to be an NFL season, and this is a good thing. Preseason kicking off this month, start, or next month, starting off the regular season around the corner, and I know that some of you folks sitting out there today are pulling out your favorite jerseys, picking your fantasy teams, and trying to remember the subtleties of West Coast offense compared to the 3-4 defense, while I attempt to explain things like the stages of God's grace and the postmodern theories of atonement. The scripture for today is a story for the people of faith that is not unlike fourth down and one yard to go. It's like that. That's really all you have to say to make the average football fan foam at the mouth. Your team has the ball in its own territory, just short of midfield. It's late in the game. Your team is up by three points. Make that yard and your team keeps the ball, moves the chain, and burns up some of the clock. It's good. Make that yard. and You have a chance to drive deeper into your opponent's territory and ice the game. Get stopped short of that yard, however, and you run the risk of giving the other ball or the other team the ball in your territory, time on the clock, maybe to tie the score or worse, to go ahead. It's kind of a decision that forces coaches to burn time out to talk it over while the fans scream to go for it. Now, conventional wisdom would suggest that you punt in that situation. You punt. It's way too dangerous to do otherwise. You play field position. You put the outcome of the game in your defense's hands. That's the safe play, the conservative play, the one that usually makes former coaches like John Madden happy in the press box. Fans, on the other hand, are usually adamant for going for it. Old coaching maxim says that if you coach by listening to the fans, you'll probably lose your job and wind up being one of the fans. In the cases of fourth and one, however, economist David Romer of the University of California has put together some really interesting statistics. He says the fans are usually right. Romer's research concludes that on average, Teams that take the risk of going for it on fourth down seem to win more often than they lose. And this should be good news for all those screaming fans like myself. But Romer says that even the fans might be too conservative. His calculations show that teams should be going for it regularly on fourth down, even when it's early in the game. If the score is tied or even if the ball is on their side of the field, go for it backed by independent analysis that support his findings, Romer notes that even football coaches, I've noticed with the possible exception of Bill Belichick, most coaches have not yet raised a serious challenge to the results of his research. Most of them will still punt. Yet despite all that data, most coaches still call for the punt in those fourth down situations. In fact, 
after Romer published his findings a couple of years ago, coaches have seemed to become even more conservative in their play calling. It used to be that going for it on fourth down was the macho thing to do. Certain teams took on that reputation. Now going for it seems to be an egghead sort of thing to do. So, would you rather be macho or an egghead? The truth is that coaches now seem to be neither, neither macho nor egghead. And the reason may have something to do with our human behavior in general. Even though people say that they have a certain goal in mind, a certain goal that they want to achieve, their actual behavior regularly departs from the optimal path to that goal. Whether it's football coach or a military general or the CEO of a corporation or a pastor of a church, leaders are reluctant to take risks. Romer's theory is that because leaders have different goals from the people who work for them or with them, everyone wants to win, but leaders are held to a different level, a different standard than followers, especially when they lose, and even more especially when they lose by doing something that few others are really doing. Okay, so the point here may be a version of something that color analysis up in the press box often say as a team is holding on to the lead late in the game. There's a big difference between playing to win versus playing not to lose. Wayne Stewart, who teaches management at Clemson University, backs Romer's conclusions when applied to business. While owners and fans are usually focused on outcomes, managers and coaches are more often focused not on screwing up. You know, don't screw up. Don't take the risk. And according to Stewart, successful managers understand that fear of failure is often the primary cause of failure. More often than not, it is risk that is the path to reward. Whether you're talking about football, finance, faith, or the reemergence of light. <laughs> As you might suspect, I think it is especially applicable to the area of faith. That's why I'm bringing this all to you. This classic story that Faith Hatter just shared with us of Jacob's wrestling with God at the ford of the Jabbok River almost reads like that old NFL film narration. I'm sure that Art Dixon can hear it in his mind with John Facenda calling the action in that deep baritone voice of his with martial military music playing in the background. Here's one man, alone Jacob on the Jabbok, facing insurmountable odds in a life and death struggle with the game on the line. Can't you just hear it? And up to this point in his life, you could argue, well, actually, that Jacob was more prone to punt. He had tricked his older brother, Esau, into selling his birthright in a moment of weakness. Then he worked an end run around Esau with his mother, Rebecca, to force a turnover of the family blessing from Esau to himself. Jacob's response to his brother's defensive anger was to beat a hasty retreat out of the country. And after arriving at Haran, Jacob gets faked out by his uncle Laban when he weds and beds Leah instead of Rachel. A sort of just recompense for his behavior, I suspect, with his brother. The older daughter got her due even as Jacob had connected and conned Esau. So, Jacob is not a good character. He is a shady character. Like a coach who acts conservatively in the face of adversity, Jacob seems to have always been quick to punt on fourth and one, to take the safe way out. But now, but now Jacob was struck with a decision. He couldn't go back to Haran, and he couldn't move forward without risking the possibility of death at the hands of his angry brother. 
And even as he approaches the confrontation with that angry brother Esau, Jacob sends, did you get it? He sends his two wives, sends, you know, he sends all his possessions across the river first. Kind of a peace offering. Hoping that giving away all of his possessions and his family will preserve his own life. Hunting yet once again. For Jacob, it's fourth and one. What to do? It's a bit jarring at this point in the story when Genesis tells us, kind of matter-of-factly, that Jacob was left alone, a man wrestles with him until daybreak. Somehow Jacob knows who has lined up across from him on the desert playing field. That it's God in human form who has come to force the issue. Now that's a traditional interpretation, although the text simply says, man. Will Jacob punt again? Or will he grunt his way through this challenge? Risking getting pummeled by this man in order to win a greater blessing. Now, of course there are lots of ways to see this particular passage, but the key point here for me is the risk that Jacob takes in staying engaged in the struggle. Jacob wrestles hard all night until just before daybreak when the man wants to be let go. You might ask, why does he demand a release? Well, one way of looking at that is that God is trying to protect Jacob. You see, in the ancient world, if one looked upon God, one died. If you saw the face of God, it was death. You may remember Charlton Heston coming back looking terrible, having gone up on the mountain, his hair white. You may remember that burning bushes happen, or voices out of clouds and pillars of fire, but never face to face. That's, God may be trying to protect Jacob, if indeed that face to face was as deadly as possible. But daylight would reveal God's face, so God's trying to call a time out to save Jacob's life. Jacob, however, is going to keep playing until the last final whistle. I will not let you go, Jacob says, unless you bless me. Jacob choosing to risk even death in order to get a blessing from God. Well, it would have been easy to punt in the face of such an imposing defense, Jacob audibles against his tendencies and decides to go for it. Fourth and one, go for it. And what blessing was Jacob after? Again, there are lots of different ways of seeing this, but to push the football metaphor just a little bit further, Jacob seems to realize that a blessing for him would result in a fresh set of downs, a new start, a renewed confidence, that despite all that had happened in his life, despite all of the fumbles of the past, God's covenant promise was going to be realized through this new man, this new name, Israel, one who strives with God. If he can just make this last yard, Jacob knows that meeting his brother would not result in defeat, but in reconciliation. When they finally meet and Esau responds with love instead of hatred, it's no coincidence that Jacob says to his brother, to see your face is like seeing the face of God. Jacob's drive up the middle against the man left him with a limp. And like a running back who gets dinged up while pushing the pile forward, that injury was no sign of weakness, but rather a badge of honor. It was a constant reminder, a constant reminder. Jacob leaves this encounter already and forever limping as a reminder of his wrestling with God. You see, we come here on any given Sunday. We come here expecting and hoping and needing comfort, the embrace of God's love, a little time out from the vicissitudes of an often violent world. 
We don't often appreciate the blessing that comes from wrestling all night. But it was in that very blessing, it was in that very wrestling, that Jacob's life was changed forever. He risked wrestling with God through the adversity. We may come away limping, my friends, but we will come away blessed and victorious as we choose not to punt, but to wrestle with God. I'm talking about a muscular faith here. It's another part of who we are. We come for comfort, we come for solace, we come for community, we come for the loving embrace of God, yes. And we come to have our wrestling blessed. Not a faith that passively waits for God to act on our behalf, but a faith in which we work for what we pray for. At those fourth and one times, our lives, when we are battered and broken, are we willing to take the risk of pressing toward the blessing? What personal challenges are you facing that could be overcome by wrestling with God instead of punting, instead of running from God? Personal health issues? Chronic pain? Aging? Un- or underemployment and all the financial burdens that come along with that? Long standing family or marital difficulties? There could be any one of a number of reasons, personal challenges that you are facing that you are tempted to punt. I invite you to take the risk of fourth and one. Be bold in seeking the blessing. And what about the issues in our wider communities? Could our church decide to take a risk in addressing ongoing food insecurities of an increasing number of people locally and beyond? Or the increasing numbers of people that are coming to this church because they are homeless, without shelter, and without resources? What issues in our wider community could our church decide to take on around the core issues of economics like a living wage? Not just a minimum wage, but a living wage. Or about the varieties of health care that someone today said to me, because I don't have health care, I had to make the following choices. Perhaps some of you are wrestling with education the lack of it. What kinds of problems are out there that a church, if it believed that there was blessing in the struggle, might really truly take on on this fourth and one occasion? Are we going to punt? Or are we going to grunt? I'm convinced there is a huge difference between playing to win or playing not to lose. Glenn Baker and I will disagree about this all the time, and he will be the voice of reason that I desperately need to hear. But I'm going to err on the side of going for it. And in doing that, the blessings abound. In some cases, more often than should be, pastors and staff, like managers and coaches, turn away from risk. Pastors and staff focus sharply on not screwing up. They play, we play, not to lose. But what I know, what I genuinely know, is that people are drawn and inspired by a grand and daring vision. I know and I believe that people tend to rally around and support causes that are embraced wholeheartedly, beginning to end, wrestling through the struggle. I know and I believe that people stand up and take notice of behaviors and programs that require those involved to play passionately throughout their lives 
end their ministries, to take risks, to hustle, to create advantages, and to capitalize upon opportunities. I know this to be true. I see evidences in churches and faith communities having too often punted away those risky opportunities. Which is partly why I'm really pleased to be part of the United Church of Christ, who ordained the first black man, who ordained the first woman, who ordained the first openly gay man. Denominations and individual churches have too frequently punted away ministries. Ministries to the elderly, the young, the needy. Punted away those responsibilities to secular agencies like the Council for Aging, public schools, departments of health, and human services. Denominations and faith communities have too frequently refuse to exercise either the moral authority or the spiritual guidance to use all the plays in their playbook when faced with such problems as domestic violence, child abuse, budgets as moral documents, and many other social issues before us today. Which is why I am happy to see the United Church of Christ leaders and other denominational leaders arrested in our nation's capital as they were praying for those who are most affected by the proposed cuts in the budget. Organized mainland, mainline religion, especially those who receive their likelihood from it, like me, have been playing it safe hunting on fourth and one. Unfortunately, some of us have not waited until the fourth down to punt the ball of the ministry away. Some of us barely suit up for the game. Is it any wonder that our fans, church members, are leaving the stadiums, churches, in record numbers and the season ticket sales are way down? The church is at fourth and one. What now? Broken and blessed, we are encouraged by our faith to take the risks that Jacob took. If no one ever took risks, Michelangelo would have painted the Sistine floor. If we aren't willing to take risks of being blessed through our brokenness, then we are useless. That's right, useless. As useless as a wicker bedpan. As useless as a chocolate teapot, as the Brits say. As useless as a camera without film, a bike without wheels, a bucket without a bottom, a knife without a blade, a brush for a bald guy, a screen door on a submarine, a saddle without a horse, milk, bucket under a bull, useless. <laughs> I don't want us to be useless. I want us to be bold. I want us not to punt on fourth and one. I want us to play the divine odds and be blessed even in our brokenness. Jacob reveals the fourth and one mentality of the broken and the blessed. I pray that we, this church, might be so bold in our living of the faith. Amen. Perhaps, just perhaps, one of the boldest things we do is what we're preparing now, and that is to pray. Think about it. Who was it uh, last week that said to me, the kingdom of heaven is like 17 people, not being sure that their prayers are even heard, but their prayers are being used by God to create the kingdom. Or something like that. So be bold. And to enter our time of prayer together. With joys and celebration. With cares, compassion and concern. 
Join with me in these prayers around Willie Williams and his continued journey toward wholeness with Don Roth and Carolyn Chamberlain with us today, thanks be to God. For Tom and Donna's son, Tom, in his journey with cancer, for Susan Moline and her extraordinary journey and the burden that is for her, all of her family that loves her. The ongoing healing of Cindy Howard. For Dennis, Trish Foster's brother, and Ken Fogg. For Dylan Mullen, struggling mightily. For George, who is Rich's dad, Rich Rodner's dad. Maybe, maybe, slip sliding away. And as a family gathers and, and thinks about that and celebrates and, and is concerned for him, Rich, know that that your family is in our hearts as well as your dad. For Miller Tripp having recovery from post-surgery and for Erin who is Carol Conley's niece and has had just last week a one pound, 10 ounce little baby girl that you can hold in the palm of your hand and we hear is breathing on her own is amazing for that, that young family, for that little baby. And ongoing prayers for Mitchell and Michael and Brian and Owen, who are soldiers in Afghanistan and part of our community, and all of those soldiers and civilians who are in harm's way and at risk. So those are the prayers that I bring. Tell me. What do you bring today? Prayers of joy and celebration, prayers of care and concern. Rosemary, uh, Carol, if you would come down forward here, Rosemary has a prayer to offer. I have a, I have a very good friend named Brian and his family who are going through very difficult emotional and financial times. I ask for prayers for them. Prayers for Brian and his family. Brian, yeah. difficult and, and nice combination, not nice, but, it, but an important com combination, emotional and financial. How frequently do those twins come together? Prayers for them and for all of those for whom the struggles with finances and emotions converge. Sue? Yes, um, I, I, my friend, my friend I've talked about before, um, she just passed away the 27th of this month, and um, I asked for praise for her and for her whole family, and uh, I, I read it in the paper this morning. And, um, Sue, remind me of her first name. Her name's Marlene. For Marlene. Yes. <clears throat> prayers for Marlene and her family and people who love her. We loved her very much. We grew up with it. We grew up with her. All of us. Thank you. We thank we thank you for that prayer for Marlene and her dying and her living and for her family. Karen? Karen down here with Deb. <clears throat> I'm well aware that sometimes the answer to a prayer is no. And I'd like to offer for prayers of gratitude for those times when the answer is yes. Um, I've talked about my other mom, Poppy, who was told when she got out of the hospital she had somewhere between two days, two weeks, and two months. And she said piffle on that, and she's doing really well, and they've decreased the amount of home health care nurses that she needs, and she's walking on her own around her own place again. And prayers for um, Donna's daughter, LaDonna, and her family. Her husband left. Um, she's home with three children, two of whom are special needs. Hasn't worked in years because of the children. Had no idea what she was going to do. And between her community of faith, who showed up to move her, and some other variables, suddenly there is light at the end of the tunnel. And maybe this isn't all a bad thing. Sometimes that, uh, I think they say sometimes we have to be grateful for God's unanswered prayers. Well, she had a prayer we were grateful wasn't answered. And the one that was, was exactly what she needed. 
for the surprising ways that God is present in our lives, that confound experts and sometimes even confound ourselves in unexpected and pleasing ways. Thanks be to God. Carol, back there with Britt. I'd like to request prayers for wisdom for the members of Congress as we approach the deadline for the, the debt ceiling, uh, because as you pointed out, budgets are, do have a moral dimension. Um, and I think this is a, a really uh, critical time in our nation's history. And again, you people are so good at reminding me, we don't pray nearly enough for our appointed elected officials. They are in a terrible place and need all the help they can get, we can offer, and more. So prayers for wisdom for our officials. Thank you, Britt. Rich? First, thank you for the prayer for my father. Um, I'd also like to offer a prayer for uh, Dory, who's been dealing with some uh, ongoing and uh, getting worse mobility issues since Memorial Day, uh, starting with a torn meniscus and a kneecap, and now maybe some uh, back disc bulging. Uh, she's going in for some treatment later, later this week, and uh, hopefully have a diagnosis finally next week and maybe something can actually be done about it to keep her on her feet all day. So I'd offer, I'd ask for prayers for her and come to some conclusion on that. Thank you. Prayers for the difficult journey of physical health for Dory, that God's grace may be known through the intervention of all these different physicians and testings, that indeed the divinely intended wholeness and healing may be her experience. Prayers for my brother Ray, who was just diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. Oh. Okay. Prayers for Ray, recently diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. And we have witness here in this congregation's life that that diagnosis need not be an end of life diagnosis. That God's grace may be known to him in ways that he can perceive for Ray. Right behind you. Linda. Yeah, what about all our deaf people and those good looking, brilliant lip readers, their wives and husbands? <laughs> I'm not sure I heard that. <laughs> Thanks be to God. <laughs> Carol? This is a prayer of celebration and surprise. Um, <clears throat> for those of us who have been attending the church for many years, we might recognize Kuda, who snuck in a little late. And uh, Kuda used to be a, next, a neighbor of mine with her son and daughter-in-law and children. And uh, I haven't seen you, Kuda, in probably 10 years. And I'm so happy. Now that I'm 81, I choose to be called Fran Whitworth, OK? <laughs> no, no, that is my nickname. I was going to offer a phrase, if I may. It's such, I am so blessed to be here in this beautiful church. I did come to this church many, many years and brought my children here, and I served on different boards. I was a member of the diaconate for many years, and I don't know if you even call it that now. But I think that the Lord is very good, and even with our trials and tribulations, we have very, very, very many things to be thankful for. Amen. And I am thankful for many, many things. And as I grow older and older, I'm more and more thankful for things. But bless each of you, and thank you for this beautiful sanctuary. 
and for letting me be here with you. It was a close vote, but it came out positive to let you in. <laughs> Thanks be to God for return, and return with a new name, and return of smiles. Thanks be to God for a reunion. John? Uh, Doug from our uh, web community uh, via the live streaming. Uh, Christy lifts up kind of a two-part prayer. Uh, the first is for Nancy and Paul uh, that they they find this week to be uh, are full of rest and renewal. It sounds like they may be on vacation and uh, redeeming their, their outlook on life. And then the second part from Christy is that uh, the First Parish Church is just a faithful reminder of her, her uh, thankfulness for this, for this community. So, so those of you who don't know, um, that's the Paul I was talking about. So, so our streaming community brings prayers for the Zorakas who are here on vacation. And that's a lovely connection for the technology and the way the spirit can work within it. And from one who has visited, as Fran is visiting here, even now that she's away, reflects back here and says, this community, it's a faithful reminder of what's possible. Thanks be to God. <coughs> My friends, in ways that make sense to you, whether it's a closing of your eyes, a bowing of your head, a clasping of your hand, an opening of your hands, hearts, and minds, a posture, a breath, whatever <coughs> brings you to a place of prayer, let us do so. Let us be in prayer together. God, it is easy on days like this to look all around us and to be treated by the beauty of your creation, to have reunions of all kinds, to feel our hearts filled with the glory of your love. It is easy on days like these to be surrounded by the sunshine, the breeze, the flowers. Oh, gracious God, and to give you thanks. It is easy days like these, to remember those who have brought us to this time and place, to give thanks for the grace that has abounded in our lives. It is easy on days like these. And within this day, O oh gracious God, we bring our prayers of joy and celebration. We bring our prayers of care and concern for whom this day is not easy. For our leaders, that they might have wisdom. For our loved ones, that they may know of your presence in their journey. For those facing uncertainty. For those diseased in their life at this time. Hear our prayers. Use our prayers. That with your divine presence and your ongoing love, that new possibilities may emerge beyond our imagining. Oh, gracious God, make it easy in this kind of day to be your people, filled with compassion for others, filled with the joy of the faith, filled with the love that has come to us and that we freely share. Hear our prayers. 
and hear our voices as we share the prayer of your Son by saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. opportunity from our abundance, an opportunity to express gratitude, an opportunity to share our hopes and dreams and intentions, all of this to be placed symbolically or actually in a plate that will come to a neighborhood near you. Let us receive the offering at this time. gives glory to your name and honors the following of your Son, Jesus Christ. In all of this, we give you thanks. Amen.
with the voices singing, and with the souls joining, go forth into the rest of this day. Bring the vibratory patterns of this worship out into the world, hungry and desperate for the good news. Let your <clears throat> living be the good news to someone who needs to know it. Go forth in God's peace. Mm -hmm.